Good afternoon and welcome to the Friday Lecture Series at the Center for European Studies. My name is Stephanie Pleasance and I'm a Transatlantic Master's student here at UNC Chapel Hill. Today we will be hearing a lecture from Dr. Peter Straka on social policy in times of crisis, current responses, and past experience. Dr. Straka is visiting us today from the University of Bremen where he is a Senior Research Fellow and Professor of Political Science. He received his master's and doctorate from the University of Bremen, writing his dissertation on radical welfare state retrenchment and comparative perspective. Dr. Straka may be the most Googled speaker we have had yet this year, as he won the JEPP Prize for Most Downloaded Article, Not in a Special Issue, in 2011 for his article, Convergence Towards Where? In What Ways, If Any, Are Welfare States Becoming More Similar? His academic and professional career have taken him to the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, and even here to Chapel Hill. He even taught varieties of welfare capitalism to the stellar students of the TAM program, which I'm sure has been the highlight of his career. His time with the TAM program has been so influential that he can't seem to get away from us. Currently, his university is hosting several TAM students, and he recently happened to bump into two former TAM students in a train station in Cologne. Please join me in welcome Dr. Stone. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's actually really great to be here and uh, see the next group of, uh, of TAM students. Um, so my talk today is based on a book project that I've been writing together with two co-authors uh, from Bremen who uh, are now moving to other places but who were in Bremen while we wrote this book on, on crisis policy. What I'm doing today is first present you two, the two basic research questions that we asked in this book project. Then I'll we'll pr briefly present the research design that it's based upon and then uh, give an overview, a more condensed overview of the main re uh, research results, the empirical results, in two ways. First on uh, what has been called critical junctures. I will say more about what that means uh, later on. And then about the role of political parties during these crisis responses. I will try to draw a few implications uh, for future policy, future crisis responses. Okay, so the background, as I said, is a book project. The book is due to come out early next year. And I wrote this together with Alexander Kasch and Franka van Hoven. So we're all responsible for this, especially for everything that's wrong or not uh, convincing. <laughs> The background of this is the discussion about a possible return of the state during the financial crisis, that uh, the liberal capitalism was somehow uh, delegitimized and that now the, the state would come back. Liberal, of course, in the sense of more market liberal, uh, not so much in the US sense of uh, liberal democratic. So there's a Especially during the first years of the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, there was this sense of a return of the state now, that the state is coming for rescue. And then later on, there was more a sense that, that now we are entering a, a new age of austerity, maybe, that fiscal, uh, there's a fiscal crisis, fiscal consolidation, and cutbacks are what is uh, really important today. So. I think that's the, the overall, more general background of this research. And there are two implications, two assumptions uh, in this, uh, this portrait, in these two uh, stylized versions of what is this age about. One is that crisis is a time of fundamental change, that moments of crisis are really the times when, uh, when completely new things happen and are being uh, developed. And the second is that crisis responses across, uh, across countries will be very similar. They will be almost uniform. That there's one major response that we see in, uh, in maybe in different, uh, to a different extent, but that we see in virtually all of the uh, industrialized countries. And what we do in our book is challenge these two assumptions underlying much of the journalistic, but also some of the uh, social science debate here. The research questions uh, that we asked 
uh, are two. First is, does crisis actually lead to fundamental change in the domain of social policy? And second, what explains, if there are differences, what explains the differences between crisis responses across across uh, countries and time, really? Because we look at a longer historical period, not just at this the, the current crisis, but also at past crisis. So I think from the formulation of the second uh, question, you can already see that that we found more differences than uniformity. Okay, here's something. I'm not sure you can read this actually, but this was our conceptual map of crisis responses. Because in order to uh, be able to compare so many different uh, social policies across different countries and across different time in a meaningful way, we had to somehow abstract and make them manageable for comparison. So we did this through two dimensions. The first, the vertical dimension, is whether they were more expansionary or restrictive, whether these social policy changes uh, expanded benefits, for example, included more people into benefits and so on, or whether they did the opposite through cutbacks. That's the vertical dimension. The horizontal dimension is really about the quality of change. Do we find, it's not so much the extent of change, but the quality of change in the way that we find either incremental or fundamental responses. Incre incremental responses, they do change these policies, but they don't change their underlying principles of redistribution of who is included, what general groups are included. Is this a universal benefit or is it just for the needy and so on? These, these are the, the main uh, principles of, of social policy that you can find in some way or another in all the different uh, individual programs. Fundamental change, whether it's expansionary or, or, or uh, restrictive, doesn't really matter. Fundamental change uh, does restructure these, these basic principles. For example, uh, a program that used to be uh, uh, based on flat rate benefits and is now on benefits that are linked to previous earnings, there would be a, a fundamental change because there, there are different principles involved. Okay, that yields five uh, ideal typical responses. Um, incremental expansion or fundamental expansion, then in incremental retrenchment, fundamental retrenchment, and then also non-reaction because sometimes countries do not react, consciously do not react to crisis because the government thinks that everything is the way it should, that the structures that are in place uh, react in a, uh, in a positive way to, to crisis. And you know, social security is also built for these, uh, these times of economic uh, downturns. Okay, so we tried, empirically tried to uh, classify each change, each crisis response that we looked at into this scheme of five different responses. Yeah. We did this, uh, you know, this was the comparative mapping of responses, but we also tried to dig a little bit deeper and look qualitatively at the decision-making processes uh, that led to these changes. Were they really responses to crisis? How did they come about? Who was involved? Who were the actors and so on? And we did this for potentially for a very broad uh, type of uh, or broad range of different uh, social policy schemes, ranging from pensions to healthcare, labor market policy, and family policy. Labor market policy is pretty obvious during crisis that this is uh, an issue. But we also found in some countries we found crisis responses in these other areas too. Okay. So that's already quite a broad uh, approach. We did this only for four countries in this in-depth manner. Australia, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Sweden. And there's a, a rationale behind this case selection why these countries, they are very different, but they are also similar. They, we wanted to have countries uh, that are not extreme cases, that where we can have the assumption that what they do is is an autonomous reaction to crisis that is not imposed, for example, by the IMF, the EU, like we have this in Greece. Greece is certainly an interesting, uh, uh, interesting case for political scientists, uh, but it's a different logic behind this. It's not certainly not the Greek government uh, deciding 
uh, in an autonomous way here. So in these countries, in these four countries that we chose, I think the assumption is still reasonable to, to say that these are autonomous crisis decisions and not imposed by some other country or international organization. And second, we looked at small countries, relatively small countries. Uh, Australia is huge in terms of land mass, but it's a relatively small country in terms of population. So population was, our, uh, was the measure here. And the reason, again, is, be, is these are similar countries in that they have to react to world market shifts. There's a long tradition in political economy that looks at small countries because they are, uh, they are much more dependent on world markets. They do not have a large domestic market like the US or Japan or Germany that they can rely upon. So they, if something happens, uh, like global shocks, they have to somehow react to this. Of course, large countries have to react too, but these are the countries uh, that uh, are most likely to, to show a, a, a strong reaction. But there are differences between these countries we wanted to have countries that vary in terms of their political system. There are a lot of differences between these countries. And of course, in terms of the welfare state uh, type that they belong to, we have, you might have heard about the Espinandism types, and so we covered the different types here. And we have a mixed type, the Netherlands. Uh, so we wanted to make sure to include a broad, uh, a broad selection within only four countries. Okay. The second part of case selection is which time periods we wanted to look at. And here's a, a, a brief overview of the uh, economic performance in the OECD as an average. And our four countries, this is GDP, annual GDP growth uh, per year uh, from the early 1970s to today. And it's not really important to see which country is which, it's just the overall uh, uh, impression that you get. The three important periods of economic, deep economic turmoil across all the countries were the, the oil crisis in the 1970s, 1973 and 79, and their consequences, then the early 1990s, which is often, often overlooked, but which had uh, quite substantial uh, consequences in virtually all countries. And then, of course, the financial crisis of 2008 that then went into different phases now we have arrived, at least in Europe, at the, you know, in the debt crisis uh, phase of, of it. But it's really started in 2008, and that's what we see here, the 2009 recession, worldwide recession. OK, so we have four countries, three different crisis episodes with, you know, the first was two shocks and then two other shocks, four shocks, four countries. Question number one, does crisis really lead to fundamental change? The expectations that it does um, are certainly high, and you can see this, for example, in politics. A lot of politicians uh, claim this. Here is Rahm Emanuel saying, uh, about two months after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, saying, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. It's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. That has been quoted quite a lot ever since, and you might you, know, you might uh, debate whether the government actually did things that they think you could not do before or not. But that's what he what he claimed that this is one of his rules here. Okay. In political science, a very very similar argument is, is made uh, under the uh, under the title of critical juncture theory. So that's a, a basic argument of the historical institutionalist school in political science. A critical juncture is really this moment that uh, Ram Emanuel describes, a moment of institutional flux, as it has been called, that opens an opportunity for more uh, wide-ranging change. And in historical institutionalism, these moments of critical juncture are tightly linked to uh, path dependence it's really the flip side of path dependency uh, theory. You may have heard about path dependence in other contexts. It's, there's several mechanisms of path dependence. I don't want to go into detail here, but the basic idea is that you have a certain policy or a certain institution, and the longer you uh, continue with this policy, the more likely 
it gets that you will continue even further. Change is not impossible, but it gets uh, more uh, difficult uh, over time. So there's a mechanism underlying this that is self-reproducing, and you need this ex exogenous shock of a crisis that breaks up this mechanism, that loosens what ha holds this mechanism together, and then you can have more, more easy, more easily you can you can have a wide range of change. So that's historical institutionalism on a very similar idea to uh, of of change uh, compared to what uh, what Ram Emanuel did. Okay, remote. <laughs> so here's the the thing again. So we we look at we have to look at the horizontal axis of of change, whether it's incremental or fundamental. So you know, in order to answer this, this question doesn't really matter whether it's uh, restrictive or expansionary. So what did we find? It's, it's really condensed what I'm presenting now, because we have all this material on the four countries over this 40-year period, and I'm trying to give just a few highlights. What we were expecting, or what we would expect, uh, against the background of this historical institutionalism is a lot of cases where we do find these jumps, where we do find new principles uh, being introduced, new uh, schemes maybe set up, new uh, social security programs. And we actually do find cases like that. We find uh, Australia in the early 1990s, the clearest case, I think, where a new pillar was set up in the, uh, in the public pension system, or an occupational pension was newly set up in response to the crisis. We also find a massive uh, program of active labor market policy where labor market policy was mostly passive before, based on just cash payments. And now there was a whole system of services, of guarantees for jobs set, be set up in response to the crisis. So that's what we find in Australia. There's another possible case in the Netherlands. You might know that in the uh, Netherlands, currently there has been a lot of um, political turbulence. The government collapsed earlier this year uh, also over social policy measures, over cutbacks and so on. So the government collapsed, there were new elections, and then a very long government formation process that came to an end earlier this, uh, this week. Uh, I haven't been able to really look into the results of that coalition agreement. But before the collapse of the government, pretty big things were on the table, especially in pensions. So that might be, if some of these were are, are, are now uh, implemented by the new government, it might be that we will find another case of positive, fundamental crisis response. By the way, positive doesn't mean that it's in some ways normatively uh, positive or negative. So negative cases would be the incremental uh, responses, whether restrictive or expansionary, doesn't matter again. So that's what we find in the majority of, of uh, instances. So in Belgium, that's the constant pattern. We do find some expansion and then retrenchment. Uh, we find almost a non-response in the 1990s. The 2008 response was first expansionary, then restrictive. Uh, but overall, no no big changes in the sense that the structures of the Belgian system were, were changed. The Netherlands, a very similar pattern in the 1970s compared to Belgium, and Sweden too, and Sweden also in 2008 didn't do much. So the Swedish government said we have this very generous, very uh, well-functioning welfare state from their point of view, and that's what it was uh, built for, for these uh, sorts of situations. So we, we're not going to change very much about this. And actually, they adapted a little bit here and there, but no big changes that we find here. A few uh, episodes are still missing. And these are uh, actually false positives, what we call false positives, because we do find fundamental reform in some instances. But when you look into the decision-making processes in the run-up to these changes, then you can see that they were not caused by the crisis, that there was a process going on already before the crisis hit, uh, 
and uh, it was not causally linked to the crisis. Australia in the 1970s is an interesting example. There was a, a new Labour government coming into office in 1973, uh, and it wanted to introduce something, or it wanted at least more to move closer to social demo democrats in Europe, to have a more generous welfare state, a more modern welfare state from the point of view of the early 1970s. So they introduced a universal health insurance system. They expanded across the board, they expanded the uh, benefits and services. <laughs> But when you look closer, then the plans were already on the table. Before that, they came in with this big promise of modernization. And then it was introduced more despite than because of the crisis. And a genuine crisis response did not occur. And that was maybe the problem because the government uh, had to leave office uh, pretty soon in 75, um, just after they had introduced all this stuff. Australia uh, 2008 is very similar. You find for the first time paid parental leave uh, that hadn't been in place before. But again, an election promise uh, made before the crisis and then uh, this was not causally linked to, uh, to the economic downturn. Sweden is interesting in the 1990s because at least for the pension reform that uh, was introduced in the late 1990s, uh, most experts would say that was really a fundamental reform, introducing a whole new uh, pension system in, in Sweden, completely restructuring what was in place, and we agree. But again, this was a more of a co coincidence and not uh, caused by, uh, by the economic crisis. The process had started in the early 1980s, way before the crisis, and then it was just a very long-term process, uh, relatively un. Uh, uninfluenced by, by economics. Okay, so the Netherlands is another uh, example. I won't go into detail because I have to go to the other question soon. Okay, so that's the overall economic, uh, uh, sorry, empirical pattern of the quality of responses. And here you can see you find only this one positive case of Australia in the 1990s another possible one in the Netherlands at the moment. The others are either clearly negative or are perhaps a fundamental component which was, however, not linked to the, to the crisis. So this is really not what we would have expected against the background of uh, the critical juncture theory. So now some, uh, some, some historical institutionalists would probably say, oh, this is, everything is fine with this pattern, but it doesn't really dis disconfirm what, uh, what our theory says. Because our theory is, it, it basically says that there's an opportunity for large-scale change, but if you miss that opportunity, if you don't do anything, then you won't find any positive cases, but the opportunity was there. Okay, so that's something that could be claimed, and you could put this in a way that it was a necessary condition for, the, the exogenous shock was a necessary condition for, uh, for fundamental change but an insufficient condition. And so you could argue about this theoretically, but you can also test this empirically, because if it's really a necessary condition, then you shouldn't be able to find any fundamental change in between crises during normal times, logically. And so we checked for this, and we checked at least for our countries, whether we do find <coughs> fundamental change without crisis, and we do. The Netherlands, in the late 1990s, early 2000s is the clearest example here. Completely new principles and structures were introduced to the uh, Dutch welfare state. But similarly, in Belgium, at around the same time, a big pension reform after a change in government. Again, something that can be called a fundamental change. Also, some of the false positives, remember the uh, the Australian government in the 1970s, which came into uh, office with a plan for fundamental change, not because of crisis, but because of that government uh, change. Okay, so summing up, up up until here is that this exogenous shock was neither sufficient nor necessary for fundamental change. Fundamental change does happen, but it seems to be of a different uh, origin. It seems to be more uh, complex than, than what 
that we would expect. Okay, why the incremental responses? I can only be very brief on this, but of course that's the question. We have crisis, you have maybe a lot of turmoil, a lot of chaos, and why only an incremental response? And here uh, is a theory from social psychology that might be very useful in explaining this. It's called the threat rigidity hypothesis. And it basically claims that individuals as well as organizations tend to uh, react to, to existential threats by continuing things they know best. So you, you basically do what, you've, what you know best, uh, even if it's not the optimal response, but you can do something. And that's, I think, you know, also common sense. You probably know examples of people reacting like this. Uh, so I think that's a very useful uh, way of explaining this pattern. But more research would be needed in order to really confirm this, this finding on the decision-making processes. Uh, I think that's, that's pretty difficult to show. OK, so the second question was about the actual content of these crisis responses. So far, I've only talked about the quality of crisis, whether it's fundamental or incremental. But of course, a lot of stuff happened, and even the incremental stuff was uh, had a certain content. There were uh, cutbacks, quite important cutbacks in some cases, and there was expansion, so social security schemes were, uh, were expanded in order to cater for, for vulnerable groups, for uh, specific groups. And this is really uh, what the second question is about. It, the question, you know, in its full formulation would be what explains whether social policy responses were expansionary or restrictive. Whether we have, uh, on the vertical axis, whether we have uh, movement upwards or downwards. And I will focus in this talk only on one aspect. I think you may have read the paper that was sent around, it's really about the, the role of parties, because we know that parties, for the history of the welfare state, for the long-term changes, played a big role. So the question then becomes, what about the short term? What about these short to medium term responses? Do parties play a role? Does it matter whether we have social democrats in office or uh, secular conservatives, for example? So again, here's the, that's about the the vertical axis, expansion or retrenchment of social rights. <coughs> okay, the overall uh, empirical uh, picture is uh, one of diversity. We do find everything. We, we do find quite wide-ranging uh, retrenchments, but also uh, uh, expansionary responses right after the crisis. And we do find diversity not just across countries, but also across time. So one country might react with expansion uh, during one crisis and then with retrenchment during the next crisis. So we, there's really a lot of uh, differences between these uh, countries. Broad expansion, selective expansion. Here's so just some examples that we can maybe discuss later on. I don't want to go into too much detail here. So. How, how to explain this diversity? And more specifically here, does this diversity, does the empirical pattern somehow fit with the, uh, the partisan composition of government at the time? OK, so the, the answer is yes and no. In Australia, it does fit pretty well. We do find expansionary responses on the Labour gov government, as you would expect. So labor being generally positive, uh, having posit a positive attitude towards welfare state measures. So you, you would expect that they use the welfare state much more in a positive way during crisis and expand it. And we do find this. We do find this in the 70s. The early 70s are in brackets because you know, that was one of our false positives. So, but we certainly do find this in the early 1980s, early 1990s, and in 2008. In 2008, we had this massive stimulus program, which was channeled through uh, social security, and uh, so that was clearly an expansionary social policy. 
we do find conservative retrenchment when we only have one uh, period where a conservative government was in office during crisis. That was the Fraser government, but they did what we would expect, retrenchment. And more importantly, or also important, was that they throughout they criticized and tried to block these labor attempts at expansion. So we really find partisan fights here. So that would be a pretty good example of this partisan response. But in Europe, the pattern is uh, much less clear cut. We do not have this these post-election shifts, a new uh, government, there's a change in, in government in terms of the, the parties and composition, and then we, uh, we have a, a shift in, in crisis response. We do not have this in Sweden at all. We have it only to a very limited extent in Belgium and the Netherlands in the early 1980s. There's something of this where the, for the first time the retrenchment is being uh, implemented. We do have some uh, rather uh, counterintuitive uh, results for center-left parties that are involved in retrenchment or, on the other hand, center-right parties involved in expansion. So it's, it's much more murky here, this, the, the pattern. And we argue that there's something that influences whether there is a, uh, uh, whether there is um, uh, an association, an empirical association or not, and this is the size of the welfare state. And oh, that's another aspect. Of it. Let's go to the size of the welfare state. Here I put together just some data to give you a broad impression of uh, how the size of the welfare state differs across these countries. This is social expenditure as a percentage of GDP in 2007. And I put together data for some countries. We have our four countries, Australia, the Netherlands are here, Belgium and Sweden are right at the top, just behind France, uh, which is the leader. But it changes always a little bit who is the leader. Very often it's Sweden uh, across time, sometimes it's uh, Fr France or Belgium are also pretty high up the top. And these, these, these are data just, just for one year, sorry, just for one year, 2007. So it always changes a little bit who's uh, who's on top and who's at the bottom. Australia is at the bottom very often uh, and it's usually a very tight race with uh, the United States as a low spender. The Netherlands used to be a very high spender and during the 90s and 2000s they, they slowly moved down to this, to this uh, you know, middling or lower middle position. And I also put in some other countries just for illustration. Here are the, the so-called pigs, Ireland, Greece, Portugal, Italy are here. They spread out relatively uh, broadly. Uh, the UK is here. Here's the OCD average. Okay, and France at the top, as I said. Okay, so we have a lot of differences between our countries here. And we argue that this is what explains uh, the, the difference in whether parties make, a, make an impact or not. And why, why is that? Why do we make this argument? It's because the welfare state is a, a, an automatic fiscal stabilizer. During crisis, more people are unemployment, and even without policy change, you don't have to uh, have a policy change for, you know, for all the unemployment, uh, uh, unemployed people who who then uh, apply for benefits. It's just, it's already in the system. So they can apply for benefits. The system has a certain generosity and then expenditure rises or rises you know, very fast or not so fast. And that's the basic difference in the size of these, uh, these uh, automatic stabilizers. And it's not just unemployment uh, expenditure, but there are some uh, studies that show that most of the uh, most of the different schemes of the welfare state have the cyclical component that they tend to expand during crisis and then go back uh, during normal times. Maybe with the exception of uh, social services, healthcare, of course, is much less related to economic stress. But all the other countries, uh, all the other schemes, even pensions, you know, people may be uh, more inclined to to retire during uh, difficult economic times. So that also tends to. Expand. But this effect 
And the effect of stabilizing aggregate demand automatically is, of course, much larger in large welfare states. And this has also been shown in economic studies that it's about the generosity of the welfare state. What we are interested in particular is the political effect that, uh, that it has. Because if, you, if most of the stabilization goes on automatically, then it's behind the backs of politicians. Parties don't really uh, influence that. And there may be some crisis responses, but then they're usually about a certain group of people that are particularly vulnerable. And then later on, they may be about uh, the fiscal consequence. Because, of course, if you have a la large fiscal stimulus automatically, and then the economy doesn't really get better for whatever reason, then you are left with a lot of uh, fiscal uh, problems. And then this often comes in then at a later stage. In small welfare states, you have much more of a need for discretionary fiscal stimulus, you know, as the, the so-called Obama stimulus, as it is called now in the, in the campaign, but which was really typical for, uh, uh, for such a small state. You know, you've seen the US uh, doesn't really spend very much on, uh, on these issues compared to other countries. So a small welfare state, there's more of a need for a discretionary response, and this then has the tendency to be picked up by parties and really uh, end up in a fight about what's the state to do and so on. And you can see, you know, you can see the result, uh, I think, in the US at the moment. But you can also see it in countries like Australia. Okay, so that's the question of how generalizable we can maybe, you, you know much more about the current U.S. situation. Uh, there are other countries that are broadly confirm our result. The U.K., it's a very partisan issue. Uh, New Zealand is also similar. And on the other hand, big spenders like Germany and France had a relatively pragmatic uh, approach, not very, not much partisan uh, fights about this. Okay, so my overall conclusions for the for the research part is that crisis doesn't seem to be a, a time for fundamental reform. Fundamental reform does happen, but probably through different mechanisms and not this critical juncture type uh, mechanism. And crisis reactions, the content of crisis reactions depends on the interaction of the size uh, of the welfare state and partisan factors. Okay, I tried to think about, of some policy implications because, you know, this was not really about the Euro crisis, but we had finished the book before the Euro crisis really began. So we finished writing at the beginning of this year, and then now we're working on, on the manuscript, but it's more about copy editing and so on. So the policy implications for future, uh, for future policies, I think, uh, one that these expectations again, the expectations of big bang reform are uh, probably overdrawn. And here's a, a quote by Max Weber, the uh, sociologist who, who said, and that's a quote that's quite famous in German. I'm not so sure about the, uh, about the English translation, maybe because it's also a bit awkward the way it's translated, but it, he said it's, uh, politics is a slow, strong drilling through hard boards with a combination of passion and a sense of judgment. And that's probably much closer to, even to the fundamental reforms, because when you look at them, they usually were in the making for years, and then at some point, there was a, uh, uh, they got through and then they, they were implemented. It was not this type of, okay, we have a big bang, we do something completely different all of a sudden. And the second is that there's actually a lot of diversity. We cannot really expect a lot of uniformity when the uh, crises of the past are, uh, can, us teach, uh, can teach us anything then. It's not really uniformity, but a lot of differences between the crises, uh, between the responses. And then with regard to the automatic fiscal stimulus, I think it has a lot of uh, important macroeconomic, positive macroeconomic effects. But that wasn't really our research. We're no economists. And there's already a lot of research showing that. We were interested in the political effects. And this depoliticizing effect is, I think, interesting because it shows that a large sy so system of social security allows for more pragmatic responses, maybe very swift responses, and uh, uh, 
you know, depoliticizing may be positive or negative, but I think uh, during crisis a case can be made that it has a positive effect depoliticizing these these things. You can still be of different uh, have different views about the welfare state as such, but there's probably something you need to uh, discuss during normal times and not when you need a, a swift response. Okay, so here's a little commercial for our book. <laughs> Uh, you can buy two for yourself <laughs> and your best friend <laughs> in early 2013 will be the date that we were promised. Thanks a lot. You said that you left out the kind of outliers of Greece and Italy and those, those countries that are struggling right now, but I'm going to ask a question about it anyway. Um, do you think that there's going to be, you said that there's a diversity of response, but do you think that there's going to be a political pressure to create a convergence of responses because they, because within the European Union what happens in one country affects all the other countries, or no? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, about predicting stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of pressure to for convergence with regard to these countries. But if you look at the debate, there's also pressure, for example, uh, towards Germany and some of the countries that are, seem to be seem to have gone out of the crisis uh, to increase spending, to increase demand. So that would point more towards a divergence. So it really depends again on, on where you're situated and what the current situation of the country is. So I'm not so sure that all the European countries will react, or will have to react in a similar way, but uh, the pressure to, for cutbacks is still very, very high in, uh, uh, in Greece and Italy. If you're looking at the European level, um, you have seen a lot of austerity and a lot of the governments that it's within some of the countries have a conservative approach and even though some of them like in Sweden, they have then not changed in Sweden, they have had an austerity policy in, in the European Union as some for, for example France and for example Germany and so on. So how do you, how do you view this? You think that policies, is, your policy changes depending on if you're acting with inside of your nation or if you're acting with inside of Europe or you think it's different cases so you cannot compare it? No, I think it, it, it is important, but um, austerity, is, austerity is not automatically the same as welfare state cutbacks. Of course, the welfare state is a big bulk of the overall budget, but uh, European countries have a lot of leeway in designing those cutbacks. And it doesn't have to be all cutbacks because you know, some countries introduced then uh, tax increases in some areas. So there, there is a lot <coughs> to be done, and I think it's it's wrong to equate this with uh, necessarily with welfare state cutbacks. We had the same discussion in in the 1990s, and uh, people were uh, predicting the end of the welfare state and massive cutbacks everywhere. And we we found them in some areas and in some countries, but much in a much less uniform way than, than expected. Um, I think what does happen in many countries, including for example Belgium and the Netherlands, is that this uh, first reaction was expansion and then retrenchment. And you find this especially where people, uh, sorry, where, where governments and, and econ uh, um, economies didn't really get out of the get into the onto the recovery path uh, early on and then of course you have a high debt level and you need to deal with it and so we, sometimes you have this sequence but again that's not always the case you don't find it in Sweden you don't find it in many of the countries that that uh, somehow were more uh, more successful afterwards yeah. uh, do you think that there will ever be a Europe wide will a Europe-wide welfare state? Mm. I think the chances are are even are even less uh, positive now than 
for because uh, it would would have to would have to be based on on European social solidarity of, of some kind. That, because it is then redistribution across borders, and when you look at public opinion at the moment in, in Europe, I think there's even less. Uh, 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 the, the group favoring this is uh, is tiny, and uh, even uh, even supporters of the welfare state and redistribution per se uh, are usually not in, in favor of a, a pan-European welfare state. So I think if if there will be a, a positive uh, effect from the European level on the welfare state, it will be more about creating uh, a situation where national welfare states can continue to to work and not creating a pan-European welfare state. So it will be more about regulation and uh, trying to uh, design a, a competition regime in, in, uh, in Europe that is compatible to national welfare. But I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just follow up. So, but potentially, given all the problems, um, especially in Greece, that one option that they might have would be to help, you know, make people be able to swallow a couple of these measures. Is that you could have sort of a a, um, a um, I'm not sure exactly how to phrase it, but basically a EU guarantee of certain social welfare provisions with some management thereof in order to ensure that they're actually um, uh, being implemented. But because that seems like a, a lot of the problem right now, and, and being able to implement these broad reforms is that uh, it just seems like, especially Europe is punishing Greece, or at least that's how it seems to most of the Greeks. And so you could, you could make that possible to actually do those reforms if you had some sort of social welfare insurance guaranteed by the EU. I think that's just a comment, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so you don't think that's possible? Um, something I've asked myself is if we've really learned our lesson from past crises, because it doesn't really seem that way, because now they just seem inevitable after all the like, patterns of depressions and crises. And I'm wondering if now countries actually try to avoid them, or if instead they just prepare themselves for when they know they will come again. Yeah, I think the, the second option is probably more reasonable because uh, we, we haven't really found a way of avoiding to have a crisis because all these crises, they had different uh, different origins. They came from different, They were not, the last one was a financial crisis, the first was an energy crisis, and the one in the 1990s was a, a mix of, of uh, unlucky circumstances, I guess, uh, that came during a time of a recession and then deepened the recession and made it more global. So there's no recipe against, there seems to be no recipe against crisis. And so I think the, the best way is to build more resilient systems uh, that can react to this and can maybe automatically react to this. Uh, and there's also something that hasn't been really discussed uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, the emphasis in Europe, at least, was a lot about activation, about workfare, about uh, private provision, and so on. And these are all areas that do not have strong cyclical effects, strong positive effects, or it's, at least it's very difficult to, to design in a way that they have these automatic stabilizer functions, for example. Because if you have a, a, a workfare regime, uh, it works when there's a plausible expectation that you can actually find work. But if you have a large demand shock, then the jobs are simply not there. And so it creates more frustration, but no results. So it's not really well adapted to these, these shocks. And it might be working well during normal times, but then what do you do when a crisis really hits a, a global crisis? And the same for private provision. The first thing that people uh, who are unemployed uh, have probably have to uh, put aside or you know uh, pause for a moment is uh, uh, saving for their retirement because there's not enough uh, money. So th that creates gaps once you have a crisis. And so I think you we need to think about policies that work both during normal times and during periods of crisis to make the whole thing more resilient and less of a back and forth movement. 
Can you mention that you looked at a big variety of different policies like healthcare, pension, family policies? Is there a difference between those policies, like which are more likely to expand or which are more likely to be cut? We, we try to find uh, we, we try to find something that makes sense a systematic difference between these uh, these fields. And the only thing we could come up is very trivial: is that uh, during all of the crisis in all the countries, uh, labor market policy was affected, and there were reactions in that field. And then sometimes you had uh, pension reactions and healthcare reactions, but we couldn't really find why. Uh, I think, yeah, I think sometimes a certain field was already on the agenda as something that would would be important. And some of these crisis reactions were actually also deals. For example, in Australia, you had a big uh, a pension reform in the early 1990s, with which was a deal with trade unions to get them on board. They, uh, the government wanted wage moderation because the uh, inflation was, was there. So they wanted wage moderation and they had to give the trade union something. And that, that something was uh, occupational pensions. But that's not something that you can generalize to, to different countries. So I guess it's, it's still a lot of uh, country specific stories going on. I wanted to know whether you think the idea of crisis as a whole should be uh, completely reconceptualized in terms of not a critical juncture, but a culmination of events that leads up to a point. Um, I remember speaking to someone in 2006, and he said, you know, the housing market in the United States, it's going to collapse. There's no question about it. And two years later, it collapsed. So, you know, the writing was on the wall, and maybe we shouldn't look at it as just, oh, on this day, something happened and maybe think of it in terms of, okay, someone's telling me something two or three years before it happens, maybe I should listen to them and do something about it then. What do you think of that in terms of a theoretical perspective? I think it's, uh, it's an important idea. It wasn't one idea that we looked at in the book because we just took for granted that there was a global shock of some sort and we had to look a little bit about what it meant that, for example, inflation was very high in, in the 70s, which was not much of a problem uh, this time around on the country. Um, so we had to look a little bit about the, the unfolding economically of the crisis, but we didn't really look at the origins. Uh, but what you say makes a lot of sense. The only problem is that there are always a lot, a lot of people saying, uh, things about unsustainable policies and uh, making predictions and who do you believe and there were a few who predicted uh, very accurately what happened would happen uh, with the housing market and the financial system but they weren't listened to and I think well that's that's probably human nature that uh, once you know once the the, the business goes well uh, you uh, disregard the, the risks much more. I think that's how all these crises of some sort. Uh, so some people would you say it's more about uh, greater trust and greater honesty amongst people, and yes. less, less about this agenda setting that people might have, on a, whether it's on a party line or an ideological line. Yeah, I think so. That's a good question. Um, I think that's also something, that's why we found this diversity uh, very, very surprising because at least for the 1990s and especially for the, for the current crisis, this came in a very globalized world with a lot of uh, capital mobility, with a lot of also links in terms of a lot of communication between countries. 
uh, not just competition, but but all sorts of linkages between between countries, and I think there's inter interdependence between countries, but it leaves room. It still leaves room. It's it's a question of I think it's a, it's a question of extent, and it's not something we looked into specifically this interdependent policy responses but something that I would be very interested in, in studying maybe in a, in a second uh, project, a follow-up project. But the interdependence doesn't necessarily mean uh, conformity, convergence to, a, to one model, because it can also be that uh, countries are interdependent but find their different niches in the world market, their different strategies that can work together. So it's, I think it's a bit more complicated and therefore also more complicated to, to, to study and, and certainly to predict. Okay, now I have to predict and predict about countries that I didn't even study. So <laughs> I'm very uh, uh, reluctant here. Uh, I'm not so sure it can it can it travels really well because much of what our story is is about is about really mature welfare state where a lot is already in place in terms of the systems of social security. And if you have a developing country, some of that is in place but it's usually very small, so that automatic stabilizer effect anyway doesn't play with growth, for example. And then also this idea of path dependency might not play such a big role because uh, these institutions are sometimes newer and, and not as entrenched. So there are a lot of the, the, um, the conditions, the preconditions of what, what we are trying to explain do not really hold, so I'm, I'm reluctant to say anything about that.